Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Conveners Group. Uh, I've received no apologies for today's meeting, um, although a couple of colleagues might join slightly later as committees uh, are coming to a conclusion. Uh, the meeting is in public, so uh, unlike other Conveners Group meetings, the microphones will be activated um, automatically. Um, the first item of business, the only item of business, uh, is uh, a discussion with session with the First Minister, um, which is rescheduled from uh, December. Uh, you're very welcome, First Minister. Uh, the meeting will last up to two hours. Um, we agreed to frame the meeting in two broad themes around COVID recovery and net zero, but after the discussion at the last meeting, I think we accepted there were uh, likely to be a range of issues that fell out with that, so we'll have um, a section on more general questions towards the end. Uh, I will start with questions around COVID-19 um, before moving on to net zero and then more general questions. Um, and uh, some conveners, uh, understandably, have uh, indicated they wish to ask more than one question. I will try to accommodate that as best I can. I have kind of the priorities uh, for each convener. We'll certainly get to your first priority, hopefully to your second priority, but that leads me um, very neatly onto a plea, as ever, for questions and answers to be as uh, succinct uh, as possible. But before turning to part one, could I perhaps invite uh, Claire Adamson in her role as convener of the Constitution uh, Europe and External Affairs uh, Committee to ask a, uh, an initial question based on uh, current events at the moment. Claire. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. My apologies, I can't be with you today. First Minister, can you provide an update on the Scottish Government priorities in responding to the situation in Ukraine? First Minister. Uh, many thanks, and uh, many thanks for beginning with the issue that I know is uppermost in all of our minds uh, right now. Uh, the people of Ukraine are clearly fighting a battle uh, for the freedom and independence of their own country, but I think we should always uh, remember that they are fighting a battle that matters to all of us. They are upholding uh, the principles of democracy, freedom and respect for the rule of law. And therefore, we must all not just uh, say that we stand with Ukraine, although I know that is the sentiment uh, that everyone has right now, but we must do everything we can to support the people of Ukraine in a practical sense. Clearly, the UK government uh, holds uh, most of these responsibilities and I want to uh, give a very strong uh, message of support to the actions the UK government has taken, particularly in the imposition of very tough sanctions. And I know there is a strong uh, willingness there to go even further on sanctions and I think that is important. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, stands ready to do everything uh, we can. Uh, firstly, it is really important, I think, for countries across the world, large and small, to provide as much humanitarian assistance as possible. Uh, the UN this morning, just days into this war, is estimating that around 650,000 people have already fled uh, Ukraine. So clearly there is a spiralling humanitarian crisis. Uh, we have already confirmed uh, initial financial aid, uh, £4 million. Uh, we will seek to do more uh, as this situation unfortunately uh, deteriorates as it's likely to do and uh, there is a consignment of uh, medical supplies leaving Scotland today uh, bound for Ukraine. I've just come from uh, the National Services Scotland distribution uh, hub uh, to see and to thank uh, those who've worked hard to do that. Uh, the second uh, priority in which the Scottish Government's got a big part to play, although uh, responsibility first and foremost does lie with the UK Government, is in welcoming uh, refugees, those fleeing uh, Ukraine and seeking sanctuary. Um, we are already in discussions with COSLA, making sure that we are prepared uh, in a practical sense to welcome uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, we have recent experience through the Syrian resettlement scheme, more recent experience through the uh, Afghan uh, resettlement efforts. Uh, but I don't think any of us are yet properly uh, grasping the magnitude uh, of what the war in Ukraine uh, may result in in terms of population displacement, and it is really important that we all play our part. Uh, I am on record, I'm far from alone in this, in encouraging the UK government to go much further than it has done so far in enabling people to come to the UK from Ukraine. I think it has made some positive steps in the last 24, 48 hours, uh, but still lags uh, way behind the European Union, 
and uh, within that, of course, countries like Ireland who days ago uh, waived visa requirements. So I would appeal again to the UK government uh, to effectively have a situation where anybody fleeing Ukraine can come to the UK uh, and we deal with the bureaucracy and the paperwork later. That's the humanitarian response uh, that is required. But it's also what is practically necessary because no single country or small group of countries is going to be able to deal with this alone. Um, so I hope that we will see further movement from the UK government for my part, and this is my responsibility, we will continue to work with COSLA uh, to make sure that we are ready to provide the assistance that refugees uh, need. Uh, but I know all of us uh, are thinking of those in Ukraine, from the President down, uh, showing unbelievable uh, bravery and courage, and our thoughts are with them, uh, but it's much, much more important that our practical assistance and solidarity is with them too. Thank you very much indeed, First Minister. I'm conscious we could spend the entire session on this issue, and I'm sure we'll have opportunities in the Chamber over the days and weeks ahead uh, to return to it. But um, I would invite Sean, uh, Siobhan Brown to begin the questioning under the COVID uh, recovery um, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I ask First Minister, um, as we move on to COVID recovery, the strategic framework signals support for a level of home working to be embedded into society as we move to the new normal. This re represents quite a significant significant shift both for our society and our economy. How does the Scottish Government propose to analyse the impact on, say, mental health, public transport use and also our town centres and city centres of the policy decision and will you share this analysis with our committee? Many thanks. I think it's um, a very central uh, question and consideration um, at this time. Obviously, of course, we were seeing pre-COVID you know, a, a change uh, albeit quite a slow change in the pattern of work and uh, a growth in home working. Um, but the experience of COVID, what was necessary in, uh, throughout much of the past two years, has rapidly accelerated that shift. And I don't think any of us really fully understand yet exactly where the new normal uh, will settle and, and what the, the balance will turn out to be. But I think it is uh, reasonable to predict and indeed perhaps, and I'll come on to this in a second, to encourage a greater uh, degree of home working and hybrid working between uh, people's homes and, and workplaces, as well as encouraging uh, in office or in workplace working local, uh, more locally, so you know, hubs in, in more local communities. Um, I think there are many potential advantages to that. In the most immediate term, as has been the case over the past two years, it helps our resilience against spread of infection uh, is, is the most immediate advantage. But longer term and more fundamentally, I do think it has advantages for work-life balance. Uh, it has obvious advantages in terms of reducing our carbon footprint and reducing uh, commutes to and from work. And it has advantages, and there's some evidence already emerging of this, around increased productivity. But on the other side of that, there are concerns that I know many businesses and, and many individuals will express. The danger of isolation and negative impacts on mental health, definitely a serious consideration around impact on town centres and businesses that are located in town centres. And we need to think about all of these things very carefully as we find that new normal in the period ahead. So we are currently scoping some uh, work at pace uh, with stakeholders uh, and with business organisations and across government uh, to look at the evidence that is available already, uh, but also to consider what more evidence we need to gather to properly understand and assess the experience of hybrid working and to do that from a range of different policy perspectives. And of course, we will be uh, very happy to share that with your committee as that work develops. I thank the First Minister for that, for that answer. I think we all agree that life's not going to be going back to the way it was, and I think it's finding the balance between um, what's right for employees and employers. Uh, could I just ask, moving on to the economic impact, and the strategic framework notes that the economic output of consumer-facing service sectors, such as hospitality, remain notably below pre-pandemic levels still. So the framework therefore recognises that business resilience for these sectors will be really important going forward as they're mo most likely to be affected if we have further restrictions. What does greater business resilience look like to you and how is the government working with these sectors, particularly hospitality, to ensure that they can be more resilient in the future? There's no doubt at all that what you've rightly described as consumer-facing businesses have suffered, in an economic sense, the greatest impact of the pandemic for obvious reasons, because they're the settings where, because people uh, go and gather together, you know, 
pose, through no fault of these businesses, I hasten to add, pose the, the greatest risk of transmission of infection. Um, now, we've sought as far as we possibly can to provide financial support uh, and compensation to businesses that have either been closed for periods or have had their trading uh, curtailed and, and restricted, and that's been important. Obviously, we want to come out of this phase of the pandemic and, uh, as far as we possibly can, uh, face up to any future risks. I think we all understand you know, the risk that the, the, the virus poses to us has not gone away. New variants, in particular, uh, may well challenge us in future. But if we build resilience now, the hope is, together with vaccines and treatments, that we will be able to deal with any future risk much less restrictively uh, than was the case in the past. So a key part of that, and the strategic framework goes into some of this, is working, and there's no one-size-fits-all. What will be um, important in a shop and in a pub or restaurant will be different. But to get to provide guidance uh, to businesses as to the measures that they can introduce now or retain, because they might have had them in place earlier in the pandemic, uh, to reduce infection risks. Uh, also, we've provided uh, some uh, funding for particular priorities, the uh, funding for ventilation improvements in uh, private businesses, focusing on uh, smaller businesses in the sectors most uh, most affected. Um, and we'll continue to do that and work with stakeholders to uh, look at what more we can do. My final point, though, is, I suppose, a bigger point in, in, or, or a more general point. If we all continue to get back to normal, which is what we do, but continue to take basic steps to try to re reduce the risk of infection, then we all collectively help ensure that these businesses can function uh, without some of the things they've had to deal with in the past two years. Uh, and lastly, lastly, in that context, if we do that, then it's possible, as we are already doing, to encourage people to feel confident about going back to shops about going back to pubs and restaurants, going back to the theatre or the cinema. Um, and that's what we need to do. We need to have that confidence that people can go about their daily lives, which is what these businesses need more than anything right now. Before I move to Richard Leonard, I'm, I know Claire Baker was um, wishing to ask questions broadly in this area, and I wonder whether um, I can invite Claire to ask her questions at this stage and then come to Richard. Um, yes, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, First Minister, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation was published yesterday. Um, I do have to say it's disappointing that the Economy and Fair Work Committee haven't had formal notification of the publication, but we do intend to um, engage with the Cabinet Secretary as, as soon as possible. When it was published yesterday, there has obviously been um, some mixed reviews of it. I know you can bring forward positive comments from Chamber of Commerce and others, but um, Tom Hunter did express concerns it was a long wish list with no magic wand to deliver it. I think that's linked to the issue of the delivery plans. Um, so can I ask about the delivery plans and when, uh, why they're not included in the strategy? Will the actions be developed by sector? Um, how will the progress on the delivery plans be measured and how will progress be charted through the delivery plans? What kind of oversight and engagement will the government have with delivery of them? Well, firstly, I, I know uh, the Economy Secretary is you know, very keen, um, and indeed it is part of our responsibility to engage closely with the committee um, as this develops. It is the government's responsibility to uh, design and, and develop in partnership with stakeholders uh, strategies uh, like the one uh, that was published yesterday, uh, and then of course to engage uh, with Parliament as we uh, develop that and take that forward, and in particular to engage with Parliament around the scrutiny and the delivery. Um, you know, inevitably, with any strategy of that nature, you're going to get mixed opinions. That's uh, in the context of uh, world affairs right now. We should actually welcome the, the sort of healthy um, aspect of that in a, in a vibrant democracy. Um, and it's important that we listen to those who have uh, expressed uh, comments that say they wanted to go further or they wanted to do different things, just as I could. I could sit here and you know, listen. I'm not going to. Uh, lots of comments from individuals and organisations that are very positive about what was set out uh, yesterday. Um, I, I'm sure I'm, I won't be the first to break it to, to Sir Tom Hunter that there is no such thing in politics or governance or life in general as a magic wand. Uh, you need to set out your ambitions and work really hard and, and focus on these. Uh, we will uh, set out more detail of the, the delivery plans, the governance of that. We've uh, set out, Kate Forbes set out uh, plans for the sort of operational uh, oversight of that, uh, a leadership board that I will chair to sort of track progress on that. And we will regularly report to Parliament on the, the key 
uh, deliverables there and progress against uh, this. Any strategy, no matter uh, how uh, good a strategy is, and I think this one is very solid and very good, uh, delivers all of the detail. It is about setting the vision, it's about setting the ambition, um, and then ensuring uh, that we have the focus on delivery uh, to turn that into reality. Thank, thank you. Uh, maybe change subject, which is closer to Siobhan Brown's question, which is around the tourism recovery programme, the COVID-19 tourism recovery programme. Uh, there is a phase two where um, the sector had asked for funding to be in the budget. Um, Kate Forbes did appear in front of the committee and gave her commitment to phase two, but couldn't deliver the resources for it within the budget. Um, is there, she has indicated there would be the opportunity for in-year um, budget transfers. Does the First Minister recognise the importance of this sector and the need for them to receive further support? And can she give any assurances that they will be prioritised when it comes to any redistribution of funds? So, firstly, yes, I recognise the importance of it. Tourism is one of uh, Scotland's uh, most important economic sectors. Um, obviously, in terms of the jobs it provides, the uh, revenue it raises, but also in terms of projecting Scotland's brand and reputation overseas. It is, it is vital and uh, our tourism sector um, is one of the jewels in, in the crowns of, of Scotland and we should support it and uh, do everything we can to help it recover and, and regain the, the huge success that it had going into uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, clearly, we work with the budget we have and we have difficult choices that we had to make in the budget and will continue to have to make. But I think, as uh, Kate Forbes has indicated, in terms of in-year decisions, we absolutely recognise the importance of uh, supporting tourism. Going back, uh, there's a point I made in uh, response to Siobhan about uh, confidence. This is also true in terms of the tourism sector and true not just in a domestic uh, sense, but internationally. We need to uh, be in individually here in Scotland, but collectively, globally, taking the actions that keep the virus under control so that we can build the confidence that people have uh, to go and visit other countries and hopefully come here and visit Scotland and support the tourist sector. But I absolutely recognise the importance of financial support uh, for the actions uh, that the Scottish tourism sector are taking to try to get back uh, to the position of success that they, we know that they are capable of doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I now call on Richard Leonard and I should be introducing uh, colleagues by their title. So, convener of the Public Audit Committee. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, um, we know that in 2020-2021, uh, Scottish Government total net expenditure rose by 27% compared to 2019-20, uh, an additional £10.7 billion. So when will you clearly demonstrate where that money has gone and so what difference it has made and to who? Well, in 2020-21, which I think, if I heard you correctly, was the, the year you, you cited to me there, uh, a lot of the growth and the money that was at our disposal was uh, COVID response money. And I think there are people, the length and breadth of the crime, I mean, I should say, in summary, we report in terms of budget outturn and reporting in the normal way, and you know, your committee is part of the, the scrutiny process of that. But I, I think people the length and breadth of the country uh, know, um, and there'll be different views, and of course, as there always is, on how uh, we allocate that money. But the uh, use of that money, whether that's been providing you know, vital PPE for our nurses and doctors in the front line of our health service, uh, or providing the compensation and financial support I spoke about a moment ago for businesses, uh, providing support to local government to allow them to employ uh, significant numbers of extra teachers to help uh, with the uh, the challenge in our school. So I think people can see, not just through the, the more technical outturn reporting that we do with our budgets every year, but I think people with their own eyes can see uh, what that money has been supporting over the course uh, of the, the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, again, we, in normal years, not just in, in the course of the pandemic, uh, we, we seek to guide us. I will make this sound much simpler than it is um, and much easier than it is because it's not. The National Planning uh, Performance Framework, sorry, seeks to guide all of our spending decisions so that they are uh, contributing towards the outcomes and the indicators that are set out transparently and uh, clearly for people to see. Thank you. I mean, you're right, this isn't just a technical matter and transparency is at the heart of it. I mean, the uh, Public Audit Committee in recent weeks has taken evidence uh, from the Auditor General who said uh, his report into the Scottish Government consolidated accounts highlights the need for the Scottish Government to be proactive in publishing comprehensive COVID-19 financial reporting information that clearly links budgets, funding announcements 
and spending levels. This will help to increase transparency in areas of significant parliamentary and public interest. And we had the new ish permanent secretary before the committee just last week. Be described as new. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'll call him new then. Um, Permanent Secretary before us last week, where he seemed to concur and he said he wanted to speak to Audit Scotland uh, about that and uh, he said he wanted to maximise transparency. I mean, do you recognise that there is more work to be done in transparency and uh, identifying where that uh, additional funding has gone to? Yes, I do. Um, I, I, I don't have any difficulty doing that. Uh, you know, and you know, everybody around this table knows I, I spend a significant chunks of my life looking at, you know, sort of very technical, you know, explanations and reports of how money is spent and what the performance of it is. And of course, there is a, a collective interest in making that as comprehensive, as transparent and as readable and as understandable to the layperson, I guess. Uh, I'm sure we'd all appreciate it as well. So I absolutely concur with that. And I know uh, JP, the new Permanent Secretary, is very uh, keen to talk to Audit Scotland, the Auditor General, about how uh, we do that uh, generally, as well as in terms of the additional funding for COVID. What I would say, though, in the last uh, two years, and I can say this obviously from uh, a position of uh, some considerable experience in making these decisions, is that so many of our decisions over the past two years have had to be made at pace, you know, because and by at pace, I'm talking about you know, hours and days making a difference in terms of uh, whether uh, we spent this money quickly enough to make a difference on the front line. So when we were, you know, if I cast my mind back two years, almost two years right now, in March, April, May uh, of 2020, frankly, every single day, our priority, uh, and I'm going to say this pretty unashamedly, was how quickly do we get PPE to the front line for doctors and nurses and, and social care workers, uh, rather than sitting and thinking, well, what's the sort of reporting on the transparency of, of this? So, yes, I absolutely agree. We need to go back and make sure that we uh, set out clearly how that money was spent. But in the moment, our priority was to get the money where it was needed, because, you know, in this context, what I'm about to say is not hyperbole. Lives actually were depending on it. Minister, I will now invite Stephen Kerr, convener of the Education, Children and Young People Committee, um, to pose a question. First Minister, on the same theme, I'd like to ask you about closing the poverty-related attainment gap and the Pupil Equity Fund. Audit Scotland report that they can't trace how this money has been spent. Do you know how it's been spent? <clears throat> Uh, we, yes, uh, work with local authorities, uh, with schools uh, within that uh, to consider uh, how that money is being, we know how that money has been allocated. It will be over a longer period when we can properly track uh, the impact in terms of the uh, delivery of objectives. Now, as uh, members will recall, and I appreciate uh, this was in uh, previous parliaments when you weren't uh, a member, but part of the Part of the objective of the People Equity Fund uh, was to put money directly into the hands of head teachers and allow flexibility and autonomy as to how that was, was used, rather than being overly prescriptive at the outset. Uh, so we will work uh, with Parliament, we will work with Audit Scotland, we will work internally to ensure that we are tracking, because it really matters to the overall uh, achievement of our aims in terms of reducing the attainment gap, uh, tracking what has worked, uh, what hasn't worked, because there will be things that head teachers or schools or local authorities have tried that haven't worked uh, and we've got to be open to that. Uh, so yes, uh, we do all of that, but the most important thing is recognising that our responsibility is to put resources into the hands of those at the front line of this and allow them to innovate uh, to make sure that they are delivering on that objective. I wasn't really clear from that answer whether you do know specifically how it's being spent. If you do know how it's being spent, could you publish what you know. Audit Scotland have uh, struggled to find what this money is being used for. And there are other concerns as well. I mean, this is, after all, the defining mission of the government that you lead, First Minister, to close the attainment gap. Um, but there seems to be some ambiguity about how this money is being spent. There's a concern, for example, among some that these funds are just replacing what was already being done. So not every extra penny is necessarily going to be used to provide extra support. How do you know what is happening or what is not happening? So I think you've got to distinguish uh, between allocation of money, uh, how that money is then being used on the front line, and then how we 
uh, monitor and track the impact and the outcomes of that. And these are all related, but they're actually separate. So we know exactly how the money has been allocated. Uh, we have given autonomy around the use of uh, that money. So I've, you know, over... Uh, pre-COVID visited schools that have used that money in very different ways. I you know, remember being in a school that had used it for uh, weekend away sessions for parents uh, to try to engage parents more with schools to improve attendance. Uh, I've seen other schools use it in very different ways. So there is deliberately um, a degree of autonomy and flexibility. So yes, we will know uh, the different ways in which that has been spent, but we, are, we were not deliberately not prescriptive in trying to ensure that innovation because that was what is needed. And then, and this will take more time uh, because of the nature of it, uh, we have a duty, and I, I think this is the most important aspect of this, uh, to track the progress in terms of outcomes. Uh, because, you know, inevitably, uh, in a, a, an initiative like the People Equity Fund, uh, there will be things that schools have tried that have not been as successful as other things, and that will be seen in, in the outcome. So in all three of these areas, uh, yes, we know what is, is happening, but some of that takes longer to properly assess and judge against. Are you concerned about not the potential... I've given you a couple of questions. We'll come back to you if there's, if there's time, but I'm conscious that we do need to get through uh, all of the questions, give every uh, convener an opportunity. I'll call uh, Gillian Martin, convener of uh, Health, Social Care and Sport. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, I want to concentrate my questions around uh, the care workforce uh, and the challenge that every country is facing in attracting people into that sector. Um, the Scottish Government has obviously got their ambitious manifesto commitment to establish a national care service, but it's against the backdrop of an already very tight labour market um, in social care. Could you share your thinking on tackling this challenge? and uh, how the government's working with partners to attract people into social care. So, I mean, this across health and social care is one of the biggest, perhaps the biggest challenge we face as we seek to recover health and social care um, and ensure that they deliver um, on the, the objectives that, that we set for them. Um, we, certainly in the NHS, um, Obviously, social care uh, employers are largely local government or private or voluntary organisations. We've got you know, a reasonably good foundation in terms of, in the NHS in particular, record levels of, of staffing higher you know, per head than uh, other countries in the UK, but a very, very challenging uh, recruitment position. Uh, and you rightly see we are operating within a very tight labour market. So within Scotland, there is intense competition for labour. Um, but also between Scotland and other countries, particularly for health workers, uh, there is very uh, intense competition as well. So we need to do a number of things. Firstly, we need to ensure that we've got very good, robust workforce planning so that we know what we need to achieve in, in the years to come, and Health Secretary is very focused on that. Uh, secondly, we need to focus very strongly on the, the well-being of the current workforce, because obviously a, a risk is that we, we lose people in that very competitive labour market. We're investing a lot in, in well-being initiatives in the health service. We are uh, working with uh, local authorities in particular to try to raise the pay of those in our social care workforce, which for generations has been an undervalued uh, part of the workforce, largely female workforce, which is, is part of uh, the reason for that. And we are also working with the health service and uh, with other partners on very targeted recruitment campaigns uh, within Scotland and anybody you know, who lives uh, in the west of Scotland, for example, will have seen uh, the integrated partnership in Glasgow uh, advertising on television for social care uh, workers. So we are helping with those targeted recruitment campaigns to make sure that in that competitive uh, workplace, we are uh, seeking to uh, market careers in social care as, as good uh, opportunities for people to take. None of this is easy. It is really difficult and all countries are trying to do the same, but it is a, an area of real uh, and very determined focus. Thank you for that. I've just this morning been chairing a stakeholders meeting about the National Care Service and I, I thought I'd just relay probably a thread that went through all the conversations and panels that I chaired and that was that the voices of people receiving care need to be at the centre of the design of the service, the new service that we have and a human rights approach is fundamental. Um, how will your government ensure that that happens? We're 
trying to build that in uh, from the outset. Obviously, Derek Feely's uh, review and report that sort of laid the foundations for uh, our plans in the National Care Service took very much took that uh, human rights approach with service users at the heart, and we are seeking to continue that. And that will be cabinet discussed this just uh, last week. I've uh, personally been uh, involved in very detailed discussions about. Uh, how we are taking forward uh, the plans uh, following uh, the consultation. Um, and service users, because if, if you go back to the Feely report, it's all about reducing postcode lottery, raising the quality of care, uh, making sure that we see care as an investment, being as preventative as possible, rather than uh, you know, seeing people who could be better cared for in their communities and their own homes in institutional care. So that's the objective of it, and therefore we have to keep that absolutely centrally in mind. Second to that, though, I think the voices of those who work in the care service and deliver these services has to be central too, because another objective, and the two are, are linked actually, because if you have a highly skilled, motivated and rewarded workforce, you're going to de deliver you know, good care. So the opportunity here to deliver um, a, a nationally uh, agreed pay scale, collective bargaining, national terms and conditions is all really important for that first objective. So everything we do here, I, I think we're going to, in Parliament as well as in the wider uh, stakeholder community here, there's going to be some very, very you know, intense debates about the detail of this, rightly so. But I think we should all come at it from uh, the perspective of remembering what it's all about, which is improving the quality of care uh, for those who need it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call on Joe Fitzpatrick, uh, Convener of Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice. Joe. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, First Minister, we know that there was a disproportionate impact on some sections of society through the pandemic, including older people, disabled people, carers, women. And just yesterday, our committee heard about the intersectional challenges faced by BME women. So the Scottish Government has said, and you, you mentioned it in the last question, that a human rights approach um, was at the heart of decision making throughout the pandemic. So what lessons um, can be learned from, from that approach in terms of policy making? It became obvious, it's probably always obvious, but it came much more obvious very quickly in the, the handling of the pandemic that it was having a disproportionate impact. Uh, it was having an awful impact on everybody, but some groups, ethnic minorities, uh, absolutely women, young people, those already living in poverty were being uh, particularly impacted. So we sought to take account of that in our decision making. I'll go back to the point I made uh, to Richard earlier, to be absolutely candid, particularly in the very early days and then at key points afterwards, speed of decision making was what was most important to us. Um, but we sought to take account, we sought to learn more about that. So the expert uh, reference group on COVID and ethnicity, for example, we established quite early on and then it used its findings to try to inform and shape uh, future decision making. Uh, so we sought to learn as we went along to take account of that disproportionate impact in the decisions we were making. So if I take an example of, you know, the, the delivery of the vaccine programme, for example, real emphasis on the part of health boards uh, in a, an effort that was, you know, massive and had to be delivered very quickly and, you know, trade-offs made between local access and mass vaccination centres, but a really strong focus on making sure that under uh, represented groups uh, that there was particular efforts to get vaccine to them. Did we get every decision right in that? I absolutely would uh, say that we won't have, um, and there is therefore a need to learn in retrospect so that we build that into to future decision making. And of course, the, the public inquiry, which will be getting underway shortly, uh, will have a human rights focus as well. And I think the learning from that will be extremely important. Thank you. We've talked a bit about some of the inequalities and a lot of these inequalities in relation to people and communities were there before COVID and a lot of them are societal. Um, but, but there's no doubt that the pandemic placed those in, in inequalities into stark focus. Um, and so I mean, I'd, just, I'd be keen to hear from the First Minister um, just a little about how we make sure we don't lose that focus and, and make sure that we, we challenge those inequalities and as I said, some of them are societal and not just for government, but make sure that we do um, challenge that going forward. 
Look, that's down to all of us, and you know, I've got a, a particular. Uh, particularly heavy responsibility as First Minister in making sure we don't, but that will be a collective uh, challenge and responsibility for, for Parliament. Um, the, the pandemic has absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, shone a very, very bright and really unforgiving light on some of the pre-existing inequalities that, that many groups in our society were facing. And as we come out of the pandemic, we need to redouble our efforts to address those. So whether that's people living in poverty, that can be immediately um, linked to the work that we are determined uh, to accelerate and and increase the impact of on you know our social security responsibilities, the, the doubling of the Scottish child payment, you know, that's not uniquely to do with the pandemic, but the experience of the pandemic is definitely a factor in the decision uh, we took to double that payment to, to recognise that we had so much uh, more that we, we needed to do there. Uh, going back to Gillian's questions about the social care workforce, we've all known that the social care workforce has always been predominantly female, undervalued, under-rewarded. And you know, there's a collective responsibility for that going back decades, generations, but there's no longer any excuse for any of us to say we don't understand that now and that we don't have a responsibility to tackle it. So that's why that's so clearly at the heart of the work we're doing in the short term, but the longer term work uh, around the National Care Service, uh, the inequalities women face. So the work we were doing before the pandemic, you know, led uh, to some extent by the, my national advisory group on, on women and girls, all just becomes so much more important because, you know, there's no, there's no hiding place anymore. None of us have any excuse for saying we don't know and understand exactly where these inequalities are. Fixing them is not easy. Uh, to go back to the comment about magic wands earlier on, there are no such things, but we need to tackle these. And, and that is for government, but it is also for parliament to make sure there's a, a real iron focus on holding our feet to the fire on it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Joe. I now uh, invite uh, Stuart McMillan, uh, convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, uh, you'll be very much aware of the report that the committee published uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding the made affirmative. Uh, and uh, you'll also be aware that the committee is considering the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill. The bill has got five powers which may be exercised subject to the made affirmative procedure. And one of the questions the committee always asks when considering any primary legislation is whether it's right to delegate powers to the government of the day rather than actually being on the face of the bill. And why do you consider it helpful to give future governments these emergency powers, such as the new public health protection regulations or altering school term dates, rather than bringing forward emergency legislation when needed, such as the two Scottish Coronavirus Acts? Obviously, the, the bill is for Parliament to scrutinise. It's not an emergency piece of legislation, so there will be full parliamentary scrutiny and you know, government will uh, respond to that in the, the normal course. Um, but in summary, why I think it's better to have uh, you know, properly considered uh, legislation on the statute book that provides a framework for these decisions rather than having emergency legislation is that emergency legislation is always suboptimal. You don't want to operate through emergency legislation if you don't have to. So uh, there is, I think, an opportunity for us here to get the legislative framework for this in a better state now than it was as we went into this pandemic. And I think we always have to be very, very uh, mindful of the appropriate balance between government uh, decision and parliamentary scrutiny. The latter is absolutely vital, even in emergency uh, situations. Um, but we also have to recognise that in emergency situations, governments have to act uh, quickly. And so made affirmative procedure, for example, should always be used really, really sparingly. Um, but I think the more fit for purpose your existing legislative framework is, the less need there will be in reality to act on an emergency basis. Okay, okay thank you. Um, one more. Thank you. Uh, so, so just uh, on the back of that, First Minister, um, uh, I did mention about the report uh, that uh, the committee has published, and certainly some witnesses made the point regarding the use of the made affirmative procedure as part of the uh, broader narrative, certainly going back generations of the, the constant need to ensure that uh, there is an appropriate balance of power between the government of the day and also the legislature. So looking back over the pandemic, how did you weigh up that balance when making decisions which would sometimes bring substantial changes into force almost immediately and often appreciate with very little time to make such difficult choices. 
Um, we, you know, the, I'm sure some members will, you know, be more sceptical than others about what I'm about to say here. But I can genuinely say that need for uh, a balance between speed of government decision making and appropriate and full parliamentary scrutiny was always there as one of the considerations. But where that balance was struck at any given time, it couldn't be a fixed thing throughout the pandemic because at, at times. Certainly early on in the pandemic, uh, we were operating literally on a basis where every minute our day mattered in terms of the speed of the decisions we were taking. Parliament was obviously not sitting normally at that point, so we had to you know, have different procedures in place for informing Parliament for having parliamentary scrutiny. There were then periods of time where we could act on a, a slower, base, relatively slower basis. Parliament was sitting more normally, and that balance then it changed. We then went into, and you know, I, I think John Swinney might have used this example with the committee before, but it's one that sticks very, very firmly in my mind. November. Uh, last year, just at the tail end of last year, I chaired a cabinet meeting. Uh, basically, uh, the sort of mood of the cabinet that day, my report to cabinet that day was that things were very stable. I think I said that to parliament that afternoon in my, my Tuesday afternoon statement. Literally within 48 hours, we were in, back on an emergency footing, facing Omicron and facing the prospect of having to take really quick decisions to curtail something that was spreading very fast. So that was the speed at which things were changing and we have to be able to, re to respond to that. Um, made affirmative procedure should only be used in exceptional circumstances. It just so happens that much of the last two years have been exceptional circumstances. There are, is also, and this is not really for me, it's for committees and parliament as a whole, the normal affirmative procedure is very, very lengthy. It's, you know, 40 days uh, and then a plenary vote. And in the face of a, a virus, that's clearly not fit for purpose. So maybe, maybe there are debates about making our normal procedures more flexible so that the use of emergency procedures is not as necessary. And I go back to the point, we have an opportunity now to get our statute book and parliamentary procedures perhaps into a state where if we ever, which hopefully we won't, face the same circumstances again, use of genuinely emergency procedures are not as necessary as they were in what we faced over the past couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. I, I now call on Audrey Nicholl, convener of the Criminal Justice Committee, who joins us online. Audrey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. First Minister, the Criminal Justice Committee has heard from the court service that the trial backlog might continue because of the pandemic. And we've also heard testimony private from survivors of rape and sexual offences, and they told us of the harrowing impact that trial delays uh, were having on them and how each time a trial is adjourned, it can potentially re-traumatise them. And one person told us uh, their trial had in fact been rescheduled around 13 times. So can I ask the First Minister, how will the Scottish Government's new vision for justice place victims at the heart of the justice system and assist in reducing the backlog of criminal cases. Thanks uh, for that question. I, I think, firstly, and, and this, I, I'm going to obviously uh, tailor to the, the criminal justice question here, but it, it is a comment that could apply more generally. We've got to be frank and honest about the the scale of the challenge of recovery. You know, the the, the pandemic and, and the impacts of dealing with the pandemic you know, brought whole sec, you know, swathes of our normal way of life to a shuddering halt uh, for long periods of time. It is not going to be easy or quick in all senses to recover from that. And that is the case in the criminal justice system. Uh, justice agencies have been clear all along that the recovery programme is likely to take a number of years uh, to address that backlog. But they've also been clear that just how long it takes will depend on the actions we take and the investments we make. So this is not a fixed thing, and I'll come back to uh, those actions and investments in a moment. It's also really important uh, to stress that 
when we're talking about a period of years, whether that's four or five years that you know, has been talked about to tackle backlogs, we're talking about uh, bringing the overall caseload uh, back into uh, the kind of normal timescales. That does not mean individual cases will be delayed for uh, that period of time. And I think it's important to, to understand that from the perspective of victims for whom this is uh, so hugely important. Uh, but we are seeking to work with justice agencies and make the investments uh, principally in the court service, but also in, in the Crown Office, uh, with the police to uh, get the recovery uh, programme uh, moving as quickly as possible. So, as uh, you will know from uh, the committee perspective, we've established the Justice Recovery Fund, uh, which is upwards of £50 million for the next financial year. That's going to uh, support uh, recovery and renewal. And, uh, about half of that, just uh, yeah, around half of that goes to the, the court service, uh, but there's also uh, funding there to other parts of the, the criminal justice uh, system. Uh, we've also uh, increased the, the normal uh, court service uh, resource budget in the budget. So uh, there is that uh, investment there to try to accelerate uh, this progress, and we'll continue to work with justice agencies as we go to, to make sure that we are doing everything we, we can. Um, I think there are, you, you mentioned. Um, victims of rape and sexual assault. There are bigger, uh, wider issues there that predate COVID about how the criminal justice system deals with these. You know, obviously, Lady Dorian has uh, produced a report for us that we are considering carefully in terms of, for example, the, use, uh, the greater use of specialist courts in future. Uh, we're also uh, going to hear over the next couple of weeks from Helena Kennedy in terms of the work she's been doing uh, for us around tackling misogyny. So there are, there are deeper issues there that, as we recover the criminal justice system, we've also got to do more to address. Audrey, do you want to come back with a follow-up question at this stage? Yes, if, if I may, and if there is time, presiding officer, th thank you, First, First Minister, for that. And if, if I may come in uh, with a follow-up question uh, around the issue of problem drug use and tackling uh, drugs deaths. Um, First Minister, many of the issues affecting um, our communities, and in particular in this context, are cross-cutting. And um, one urgent issue to be addressed is how we tackle drugs deaths and problem drug use. And, Solutions to this problem do not always fall easily into one committee's uh, remit. And members of the Criminal Justice, the Health and Social Justice Committees uh, met recently to take evidence and consider how we can work collaboratively to find solutions. I wonder if you can provide an assurance that ministers will similarly work collectively across portfolios uh, and keep the relevant committees updated on the actions that are being taken uh, to try and address this issue? I, I will give that assurance. You know, the, the, the efforts to tackle drug misuse and to cut the you know, completely unacceptable toll of, of deaths from drugs in Scotland is truly cross-cutting. It will not be uh, tackled effectively if it is seen as, as sitting only in one part of, of government responsibilities. The uh, reason Angela Constance, who uh, is the Drugs Minister, of course, uh, sits uh, effectively uh, in a, a situation in government where she reports directly to me, is to, to give her that cross-government uh, approach, because you know, this is about ensuring uh, good community services, preventative services, to try to stop people uh, falling into drug misuse in the first place. It's about making sure that there is treatment uh, availability much uh, more rapid and effective than it has been in the past. It's about making sure that we have a, a sensitive criminal justice approach, because I am a firm believer, and I think that it's consensus in Parliament in this, that it should be seen not fundamentally as a criminal justice issue, but as a public health issue. If we look at uh, the, the efforts that have been underway recently, uh, just to, to get the use of uh, naloxone uh, rolled out, uh, that's been you know, genuinely cross-cutting as well. So this has to be seen in that way, or it won't succeed. And, uh, so, yes, I give that assurance from the government and also happy to work with committees to you know, see how we can ensure that that approach is mirrored in Parliament as well. Thank you very much, uh, First Minister. And the final um, set of questions in this section, I call Eleanor Whittam, convener of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Good afternoon, First Minister. Whilst the Scottish child payment, and indeed its doubling, is a very big step forward in tackling child poverty, the current cost of living crisis and our continued recovery from the pandemic means that budgets in households and governments are being very much stretched. If tackling child poverty is a national mission, what more can all spheres of government, businesses and indeed wider society do? And how will COVID consequentials from the UK be spent in Scotland to support people with low incomes? Well, I mean, I think you've framed the question absolutely correctly because a social, in any country, in my view, a social security uh, system um, is, is a mark of how civilised that country is. It's, a, it's an essential way of providing a safety net for people so that they don't fall into to poverty and destitution. Properly designed and implemented, it should help lift people out of poverty. It should, where people are able to work, provide a, a good bridge into to well-paying work. But when it becomes a, a sticking plaster for failures elsewhere, uh, that's where I think uh, we have problems and it doesn't work as effectively uh, as it could. And our limited devolved social security system is to some extent right now operating as a sticking plaster uh, to cover up the impact as far as we can of decisions that are being taken by the UK government. Um, so you know, much of it, it's about £100 million a year or something we're spending to mitigate decisions taken elsewhere, whether that's the bedroom tax or you know, trying to find ways of mitigating the removal of the universal credit uplift. Um, that makes no sense and you know, it's not the most effective way to use money uh, properly to, to lift people out of poverty. Similarly, if, if you end up subsidising uh, companies that are not paying a decent wage, that is not the best approach either. So that's why we put so much emphasis on the real living wage and, and businesses across the country, really, really tough time for businesses as it is for individuals just now. But paying people good wages helps productivity, helps business success, but it helps to ensure uh, that we are uh, lifting people out of poverty through work. One of the most shameful things of the poverty statistics for Scotland and the rest of the UK is so many people in poverty are also working. And that tells us that there is a real issue there in terms of uh, the reward people get for, for doing a, a day's work. So we have to see it across all of uh, these uh, different spheres, and I think it's vital that we do so. Thank you very much for your answer. How are we going to measure the impacts of the decisions that we take in and with regards to this um, and our actions? Um, will current reporting mechanisms be adequate going forward? I'd be interested in the committee's views to see if we should augment or, or change any of those. Uh, but if you take child poverty, for example, uh, there are very, very hard uh, of judge uh, measures that will judge our success or not. They are statutory targets that we are working to meet and it will be you know, very clear and transparent about whether we meet these uh, or not and the extent to which we, we don't meet them. And it's, it's, as we do the spending review, which we are engaged in right now, it is one of the most uh, serious uh, preoccupations of me and, and my ministers is how we ensure that that spending review is concluded in a way that gives us the best possible chance of, of meeting the child poverty targets because not meeting them, you know, they are statutory targets and they're also morally important targets in terms of lifting kids out of, of poverty. So that is uh, the sort of uh, approach we're taking and will be judged very, very clearly on that. Uh, I'll say again, and, you know, people who want to will hear me when I say this, making a constitutional point and, you know, I have been known to make those. I confess, so I'm not going to, uh, to, to plead total innocence on that. But it's also just a practical point I'm making about effective governance. It doesn't, when we have a situation right now where we are doubling the Scottish child payment to try to help us meet the child poverty targets, but a government in London is taking away, with the other hand, money from the very families we are trying to help, then that makes no sense. And it, it makes it more difficult to do the right thing and to achieve the right thing, which is why uh, whatever anybody thinks about the wider constitutional questions, uh, joining up these powers and these decisions in a much more holistic and comprehensive social security uh, set of powers for this parliament seems to me to be absolutely the sensible and actually necessary thing to do.
I'm, I'm now going to move on to the second broad theme, uh, which is Net Zero, and I invite Dean Lockhart, the Convener of Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, to kick. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. For, First Minister, the Scottish Government has estimated that the, the retrofitting and decarbonisation of buildings by 2030 will cost more than £33 billion. How will this be funded? Because local authorities have told the Net Zero Committee that they don't have the funds. They are facing a budget cut of more than £250 million this year alone. I will resist the temptation to uh, go off on a tangent about how uh, local authorities are not facing a cut uh, this year. Local authority budgets are increasing um, and the total local government settlement has increased, but we'll, we'll put that to one side. And, um, look, we've been very candid about this. This is a massive uh, obligation. It is central to meeting our overall net zero targets, uh, the decarbonisation of how we heat our, our homes and our buildings. Uh, Public money uh, will be a key part of how we fund that, and we have already made uh, commitments to funding for the duration of this Parliament. Again, it's one of the key uh, issues in our spending review considerations right now, and it will be issues for uh, future Parliaments as we go um, towards that 2030 milestone. But we will also have to uh, work to lever in private sector investment, and that also is a key focus of what we are doing. And of course, there will be and our uh, efforts have to be to minimise the, the financial burden on individuals, but this will be a collective, as will so many different aspects of the obligation we have to meet net zero, and that is very much not just for the Scottish Government, for governments across the world, uh, issues that we're grappling with right now. Uh I understand there are various initiatives looking at this, looking at raising finance, but the, the target is not so much 2030. The sheer physical work required to retrofit and decarbonise more than a million buildings across Scotland by 2030, that means the physical work will have to start now, effectively. It's going to take more than five years for that physical work to, to take place. In effect, that means the Scottish Government will have to raise the necessary financing over the next two or three years. And I'm not convinced there's enough work being done on this in terms of leveraging in the necessary private investment. Well, if you're not convinced on behalf of your committee, our job is to engage with you so that we can give you greater confidence and you can properly scrutinise these plans. And, and these uh, plans uh, are well underway within the Scottish Government. Uh, we've made you know, significant commitments to public funding as a contribution to this over this Parliament. And uh, we are working uh, to ensure that we are able to start to lever in uh, the finance. And I, I think there is, uh, there would be a very um, interesting and, and technical uh, debate that we could have about, uh, and we'd probably need others to contribute to it, to, to the, the phasing of this that will be needed between now and 2030. Although I do, I do concede your point that much of this will be front-loaded in terms of the infrastructure that is needed. You know, it's one of, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, when this is one of the most uh, significant and difficult challenges we face, but not meeting it is not an option because we need to meet the net zero target. So we will continue to engage with your committee about the fine detail of those plans, uh, but we're very focused on making sure not just that uh, we've got that 2030 target in mind, but that we're taking decisions with the appropriate phasing, because if, if we don't do that, as you're saying, meeting that target will not be possible. Um, I now invite uh, Jackson Carlow, convener of the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee. Jackson. Next week, the Parliament is going to welcome its youngest ever petitioner uh, to the Parliament, Callum Isted is seven years old. He's from Livingston. He's, I don't think I'm going to find it very daunting. He's already a veteran of the COP26, uh, but is coming. And his petition is to provide every primary school children in Scotland with a reusable water bottle. He's worked out that we are providing 250 millimetre disposable plastic bottles to children all over Scotland. Uh, he's been very active in his own school. He's fundraised for this and is now looking in his petition to find a means by which this can be uh, rolled out to school children across all of Scotland. So I'm sure he would be delighted to hear you commend him on his initiative. But there's a broader point, too, because this is exceptional. Um, not just to hear from young people, but to hear from many other groups in Scotland actively participating in a deliberative way with our politics. And uh, that's part of the responsibility of the Parliament. It's part of the reason why my committee has been given the citizens' engagement aspect to it. But I wonder how the Scottish Government sees its role in all of this, touching partly on the point Gillian Martin made. At what stage can we put in place mechanisms to allow groups who might be affected by evolving legislation uh, 
to participate in the construction of that legislation rather than simply being able to respond ultimately to a proposal which has been largely fully formed? Um, well, first I would commend Cameron. Did, Callum. Callum, sorry. Uh, Callum, seven years old, the youngest petitioner ever. I'm, I'm just wondering whether you'll be the oldest person he's ever met in his young life. Um, <laughs> possibly, possibly not. We'll see. Um, but Callum, uh, you know, well done to him. Uh, I will uh, see whether it's possible for me to... Is he here physically to present his petition next week? Um, yep. I'm sure he would be delighted if that was possible. In which case, I, I will maybe see if I can catch a word with him and uh, see if uh, I can uh, learn more about his efforts to get a reusable water bottle to every young person, which I think is a, a really laudable uh, aim and ambition, um, and one I wish him well with. Um, in terms of young people's involvement, it's, it's quite a timely question, actually, because we do... Um, uh, have done for the past six years, actually, once a year, uh, the Cabinet... Uh, has a, a joint cabinet meeting uh, with the cabinet and representatives from the Scottish Youth Parliament and representatives from the Scottish Children's Parliament. And uh, this year's session took place yesterday, so we heard directly. Uh, I think we may be the only country, or one of the only countries in the world that actually does this. So yesterday we heard a range of presentations uh, on, on climate, on mental health, on education more generally, on you know, gender inequality, on assisted dying, on the gender recognition uh, reform proposals uh, and a whole range of, of other things. So I think we are already uh, doing a lot of good stuff to try to make sure that the voices of young people in particular are heard at a time and in a way that allows them to influence policy in advance rather than try to, to do it after decisions have been taken. We've been pioneering citizens' assemblies to try to do that as well. And the Citizens' Assembly on Climate, for example, will be really uh, instrumental in how we take forward many of the decisions around the journey to net zero. I think your committee is an important part of that, of, of getting people's voices heard in a way that can influence policy. So I, I think in Scotland, Parliament and Government, we probably do this in a way that is uh, better than many other countries, but I don't think we should close our minds to ways in which we can do it even better. Um, last point I would make in particularly about young people, I think institutions like the Scottish Youth Parliament are hugely uh, powerful in that context. And the Scottish Youth Parliament over the years can point to pieces of legislation that have been passed in this parliament that started with their campaign, Equal Marriage being uh, an example of that. I hope Callum's watching. So do I. <laughs> forward to that Although... encounter next week. But the, the Scottish Government um, has also established a group, Institutionalising Participation and Deliberative Democracy. You have been bringing together uh, various parties in relation to that. And there is an expectation that there will be a, a report published with recommendations at some point. And I, I just wonder if you're able to give some indication as to when you hope and think that might be. Um, I don't think I can give you the date right now, but I hope that will be soon. Um, we uh, will be uh, putting forward uh, proposals there on how, you know, on the infrastructure, the resources, support for things like citizens' assemblies that will be needed uh, to take that forward. So I'm happy to, uh, if we have a date or a, a rough time scale for that, get that information to your committee um, after this session. I hope Callum is actually at school, but he may be tuning in. Tuning I was, I was actually, I mean, much tuning I in hope, through his lunch break, I, no doubt. Much as I hope he is watching, I was starting to feel a bit sorry for him <laughs> if he was. OK, well, let's, let's move swiftly on, I think. Um, with that, uh, Ariane Burgess, uh, convener of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee. Ariane. Thank you. Uh, First Minister, you will be aware that the committee is taking a great deal of diverse evidence on the national planning framework, and that framework is... Um, a framework that underpins a great deal of our ambitions to net zero. Uh, how will you close the gap between the policy priorities set out in the NPF4, such as compact growth, local living and biodiversity enhancement, with the reality that planning authorities are still, for example, granting planning permission for out-of-town commercial developments and low-density housing on greenfield sites? Well, NPF for any national planning framework is in itself designed to try to close that gap by setting the overall framework in which uh, planning uh, authorities take their decisions and you know as uh, you would expect me to say it would be wrong for me to try to you know sort of comment on or or uh, issue uh, what would be described as dictates to individual planning uh, authorities on those decisions but the draft NPF 4 it advocates actually a quite fundamental change in direction and how we plan 
places. So it puts climate and nature, um, along with the uh, whole concept of a well-being economy, um, at the heart of the planning system, and then therefore it is intended to drive the decisions that are taken uh, locally. Uh, it also has specific new planning policy support for community wealth building, uh, so using uh, how communities are planned in a way that it delivers and crucially retains as much of the wealth uh, from those in local communities. Now, you're right, giving that uh, life is down to the decisions of individual planning authorities, uh, but this is about that, that will not happen unless we are providing the right framework. And NPF 4 is all about providing the right framework with the right priorities, with the right objectives and the right guidance uh, for those local decisions to be framed within. Thank you for that response. Uh, you know, in the committee, we have been working to you know, get the word out that this framework exists, that the government is uh, consulting on it. And uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are on the fact that in, in Ireland, the Taoiseach is you know, really um, uh, uh, moving alongside their uh, planning and their vision for net zero. And I, I just wonder what kind of platform we could put the MPF4 on to make sure that local authorities and other people that will have to pay attention to this framework will actually become aware that it exists. Uh, I'd be very happy to give serious consideration to the ways in which we can do that and raise the, the profile awareness, understanding and sense of engagement with it, because I think that's really important. I'm, I'm not familiar with exactly what the Taoiseach is doing around that, but happy to look at it. I know from my own experience, if I think back to uh, COP26, for example, you know, I spoke about MPF4 in, in many of the discussions and, and uh, conversations I had at, at COP. So it is there, it's something in this context I speak about regularly, but if we can do it, you know, again, by its nature, in the answers to my the answers I'm giving you to your questions right now are demonstrating this. By its nature, it sounds very abstract and technical, but it's not. It's actually about the quality um, of the environment and communities people live in now and will live in in future, and how they then contribute to people's well-being and our environment. So it's it's really really important. It's probably some of the most important stuff we talk about and communities can talk about. So you're right to say we should be doing more, and I'll certainly give some thought to how we do more to bring that to life for people. Thank you very much. Um, now call on Claire Adamson again um, to ask a further question in relation to net zero this time. Claire. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, in our recent report on the UK internal market, the committee found that the UK Internal Market Act places more emphasis on open trade than regulatory autonomy compared to the EU single market. To what extent are you concerned that the market access principles in the Act may constrain the Scottish Government in delivering in its policy priorities and commitments, including in relation to net zero? I think it's fair to say I have a very significant and profound concern um, in this respect. The Internal Market Act uh, places really quite significant constraints on the devolution settlement. To be blunt, it can automatically disapply legislation passed by this Parliament should it deem that that legislation conflicts with the, the principles uh, and the detail of the Internal Market Act. Um, and that is, I think that is democratically unacceptable, but it could uh, impede our progress to net zero and could have all sorts of other implications uh, as well. So, you know, to give just one uh, example of a live issue around this is our uh, ban on single-use plastics in Scotland. Um, whether that ban uh, can have the planned effect uh, will ultimately come down to the decision of a UK minister, because potentially it could uh, be the Internal Market Act could make it impossible uh, to apply that ban to products that are produced elsewhere in the UK uh, and come into Scotland. Um, and that's just one example. There are, there are others, uh, you know, food standards, uh, for example, if we wanted to have a particular uh, regulatory standard, uh, then it is arguable as to whether we could impose that on food products coming into Scotland from elsewhere in the UK. So these are, these are powers of this Parliament. And how this Parliament chooses to exercise those powers in this context as part of our journey to net zero it could be completely overridden by decisions of the UK government. And that is not acceptable. It, it, it is 
a power grab. Um, and I think party politics aside, I think it's something every member of this parliament should be absolutely up in arms about. You want to add? Thank you, First Minister, for your answer. Um, I think it's um, something that we, we do. The committee certainly shares a concern around. Can I just commend our committee debate this afternoon to the Chamber for anyone with an interest in this? And thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, and a spontaneous advertising break in the midst of proceeding. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And I call on uh, Finlay Carson, who I think has questions in a similar vein, and is convener of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee. Finlay. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And, and I carry on that line. There, there's, there's no doubt uh, and no question that the, the smooth operation of the internal market within the UK is hugely important to Scotland. Um, putting constitutional concerns aside, what do you think in practice the main impact of the Internal Market Act 2022 will have specifically on agricultural businesses, rural and coastal and island communities? Well, I don't think you can put constitutional arguments aside on this, uh, to be honest, and maybe we shouldn't describe it in that way because that immediately divides us. This is about fundamental issues of is this parliament capable within its own powers of taking decisions that it should be ours to take or are we happy to allow an act passed somewhere else against the wishes of this parliament to basically override these decisions. And I think that's pretty fundamental, whatever your views on the, the future, uh, constitutional future of Scotland uh, might be. And there are many examples in which uh, we may see the powers of this parliament uh, impeded um, and overridden. Uh, and you know, I think that has profound uh, questions for all of us. Um, and agriculture, you know, potentially is one of those. Agriculture, as we know, is fully uh, devolved, uh, but you know, we uh, face challenges that we don't see elsewhere in the UK in agriculture. But if you look at the principle set out in the subsidy control uh, bill, that risks uh, constraining our ability to develop policies that are tailored to meet those needs. So, you know, for example, income and Coupled support payments pay a really important role for many uh, businesses operating in our most remote and constrained areas, but they would seem to be incompatible uh, with the principles uh, of the UK's approach to what they call the internal market. So there are really profound issues here uh, which are about whether this parliament with all the, the proper debate and scrutiny and coming to decisions about these things, is able to do it? Or are we going to find ourselves uh, ridden roughshod over uh, by a government uh, that is not accountable to this parliament? Finley, do you want to follow up? Uh, Deputy Speaker, it's, 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 it's a, a different uh, question, but I think it's uh, really important to rural areas. Um, in the, the Rural Affairs Islands uh, National Environment Committee, we find there's lots of cross-cutting issues, and it's sometimes difficult to actually appreciate just what a remit is and, and scrutinise policies that are coming uh, forward. An example is MPF4, uh, where we, we did take some uh, evidence, but it was very short, uh, given time constraints, uh, on how rural areas would deliver Scotland's ambitions towards climate change and biodiversity, and there was a lack of priorities. So can I ask, what do you believe the biggest challenges are to rural uh, communities uh, when the burden of delivering climate change is on their shoulders? First Minister. Firstly, it's not obviously for me to determine the remit or you know, where committees decide to go. What I can assure you of is the, the government will always try to respond to uh, requests for information um, or, or answers or discussion on these issues. What's the biggest challenge? If you're asking, or in the context of climate, I mean, there are massive challenges facing agriculture right now, and I don't need to tell you what they are. You know, Brexit, uh, some of the, the global issues uh, impacting on, on food supply, some of the issues we're talking here about uh, the the, the potential constraints in our ability to ensure the quality of our food through decisions taken on food standards here. So these are all big challenges uh, that we need to uh, be alongside our agriculture sector as, as we face up to. In climate change, you know, agriculture is one of the, the biggest contributors to our, our carbon emissions and it is going to take a really difficult fundamental change to uh, address that and do that in a way that still protects the ability of our, our farmers and those in the agriculture sector to make a living and contribute to, to quality food. So that's the biggest challenge, and we have a duty to work with them to try to make those changes, because they are critical to our ability to meet the net zero target overall. Thank you very much, and thank you, Finlay, for moving us seamlessly into the general questions um, area. I, I can 
um, tell members who've maybe got a little bit of um, time in hand. I've got uh, Kenneth Gibson, uh, then Stephen Kerr and Audrey Nicholl down in this section. But if there are other colleagues who do have another question they want to ask, if they maybe catch, catch my eye or, or, or Irene's eye, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can. But um, I invite Kenneth Gibson, Convener of Finance and Public Administration. Kenneth. Thank you and good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, in evidence taken on the Scottish Budget, witnesses expressed great concern at the demographic challenges facing Scotland as the size of our workforce declines relative to our overall population. And this uh, is likely to result in falling income tax receipts while we whilst welfare spend increases impacting on fiscal sustainability. Uh, yesterday, the Committee University of Scotland said that the priority must be to make our economy more competitive to attract people of working age from beyond our borders and encourage more Scots to spend their working lives here. So while we lack uh, pills over immigration, we can still attract workers from elsewhere in the UK. So how will the Scottish uh, Government address these demographic challenges? Well, demographic challenges are facing all countries, but they are particularly acute in a Scottish context, and they have, you know, clearly a big impact on the future sustainability of our public finances. Now, there are short technical things we need to uh, do, technical but very important things in terms of the spending review, the review of the fiscal framework, which will determine to some extent the flexibilities year on year that a Scottish Government has to manage some of, of this. But fundamentally, in longer term, it's about ensuring uh, that we have uh, a population uh, that is uh, fit for you know, the modern economy that we're seeking to to uh, create. Now, we seek to encourage people to come here. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. We do that through the, the international marketing campaigns to encourage people here. We encourage students to come and study here and then try to encourage them to stay. Um, we work with businesses to uh, recruit internationally and we will continue to do all of that happily for Scotland. I think we have an absolutely fantastic prospectus to, to put to people in terms of everything that we've got to offer from the, the sectors that are at the cutting edge of of the developments we're seeing globally uh, right now uh, through to you know the, the beautiful environment that we have in Scotland for people to live in, the quality you know public services we have in Scotland. You know, we are deemed to have the best uh, educated uh, workforce in the whole of Europe, I think. Um, so there's a lot to commend us, but I can't, in answering this question, put to one side the fact that we don't have control of immigration, which would always be a constraint, but less of a constraint if you had a, a sort of neutral immigration policy that wasn't working against your attempt to grow the population. We face an immigration policy that is in absolute conflict with what we are seeking to do in terms of the growth of our population, uh, which is making it much harder. Obviously, the end of freedom of movement with Brexit has done that, and then a a wider immigration policy that is about constraining uh, people coming into the country makes it much more difficult. So again, a bit like social security, you know, you don't have to support Scottish independence uh, like you know you and I do to understand surely the advantages of having key powers to the future uh, sustainability of our economy sitting here, able to be exercised in a way that aligns with the objectives we've got. I think that's fundamental, but when you look at some constituencies in Edinburgh, there are seven, eight thousand sometimes EU citizens who live in some of these constituencies. I've only got two or three hundred in mine, and that's because the economy of North Ayrshire has not grown at the same pace as other areas of Scotland. So surely if we have strong economic growth, it will, at least initially, before we have the powers of immigration, if assuming we get them with independence, to attract people from elsewhere in, in the United Kingdom, because uh, that, that itself is critical. And of course, many people from my area, as you will know, having left North Ayrshire, obviously yourself, um, uh, um, move from there to other parts of Scotland and other parts of the United Kingdom. So, how do we actually ensure that we we, we deal with 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 the situation as we are at, at this time? First Minister, we, we can and are and, and should do all of that. So, you know, a, a key objective of city and region deals, for example, is to. Uh, support better, faster, more sustainable growth in parts of the country where that has that ha could be said to have lagged behind and we're working very constructively with the UK key government on that and Ayrshire uh, has benefited from that and we want to encourage people and we make a very open offer to people in all other parts of the UK to come and live and work in, in Scotland. But there is still a fundamental issue here. We can spread the cake, the existing cake more thinly and we can, yes, encourage people who are 
European citizens living here in Edinburgh to go and live in Ayrshire and having grown up there. Um, I think that is always a, a really good thing to encourage people to do. Um, but actually what Scotland needs is to grow our overall population. And we can perhaps do some of that. We should certainly try to maximise what we can do within the UK. Uh, but we are always going to run up against serious limitations if we don't have an immigration policy that is supporting that wider objective. And there will only be so long we can go down this, the track of this conversation without running full square into that pretty fundamental problem. Hey, thank you. Just one, one, one brief further question, um, which is fun, of fundamental importance to the committee and, and, and colleagues of all parties have addressed it, which is the issue of preventative spend. And the Scottish Government has had a number of successes over the years in that area uh, because it's considered crucial to addressing many of our social and economic problems. So what new areas of preventative spend are being considered by the Scottish Government at this time? So right now... Again, I've, I've referenced the spending review a couple of times already, um, and I think both of the, the, the mentions of it could fall into this category, but that's a key consideration. So if I take one example, which we've you know, made the first commitment to in, in this year's uh, the budget for the financial year that's about to start, but is a bigger commitment over uh, the, the term of the Parliament, is the Family Wellbeing Fund, uh, to ensure that we are spending money more effectively and more preventatively to you know, try to stop young people having to go into care, for example. Uh, so that's a, a new example of a well-established preventative principle. The uh, commitment, the funding commitment around tackling drugs and reducing uh, drugs deaths is also a relatively uh, new approach and is, is also preventative. I think we've done um, a number of very important things in terms of preventative spend. Going back to my answer earlier on in the uh, attainment challenge, though, it often takes a long time to properly understand and track and judge the outcome of that because in, of the nature of what you're trying to do, which is what makes it also difficult for governments to actually take the money from the, the immediate uh, things that are being supported and very visibly seen and allocate more to preventative spend, the benefits of which might take longer to feed through and become visible. First Minister, and I call on uh, Stephen Kerr again to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Stephen. Uh, First Minister, in the election campaign, John Swinney said the SNP, this is a quote, will roll out a new programme to deliver into the hands of every school child in Scotland a laptop, Chromebook or tablet to use in school and at home. How many have been issued... And why is it that we find that families, including low-income families, still do not have access to a free digital device? First Minister. Uh, I don't have the precise number right now. Uh, I'll get that for you and uh, we'll give your committee uh, more detail, if you don't already have it, of the phasing of that. It's a parliamentary term commitment and it's one we are extremely committed to. Uh, we, uh, working with COSLA, I think rolled out uh, in the region of 75,000 uh, devices and internet connections uh, over the course of pande the pandemic. There was an assessment done uh, of the numbers uh, living in uh, conditions of deprivation whereby they wouldn't have that and therefore were at risk of being digitally excluded and that was the 75,000 and we have done that and we continue to take forward this commitment which um, is one of the key commitments that we made and uh, stand by and will continue to deliver. I am very grateful for that reply and we would be very grateful to receive the detail that you have just suggested. The Cabinet Secretary uh, for Education though has suggested that this is not a promise that will be fulfilled in the short term but it can take up to five years. That does mean that Many thousands of children will have left school before the promise is delivered. And John Swinney also said at the same time as he made this commitment about every school child in Scotland having a laptop, a Chromebook or a tablet to use, that a child, this is a quote as well, a child without access to the internet will struggle. Does this mean, given that it seems that you may be sticking with what the Cabinet Secretary has said previously, does this mean that many children are going to be left to struggle for years to come? And while I'm asking questions about data points, which are important in terms of outcomes to policy objectives and promises, you mentioned, First Minister, free internet connections. Um, will you also provide the committee with details of how many children currently have a free internet connection courtesy of the Scottish Government? First Minister. Um, yeah, I'm sure we can do that. Many, many uh, will have that due to the work we did uh, in the pandemic. Look, I I'm not sure 
what is, uh, is difficult to understand about the commitment, we made a manifesto commitment to deliver something over the lifetime of this parliament. That's I standard. That. Uh, That's the point. He, he didn't actually say that at the time. There was no qualification well, to the manifesto promise. Well, the commitment, and I'd have to go back and check the terms of the manifesto, but I can assure you the commitment was to deliver this over the terms of the parliament. It's, if it's, you know, such an important commitment, it's perhaps uh, for others to answer why it wasn't in other parties' manifestos. Uh, we That's are committed point. to it and we are going to uh, deliver it. They are, uh, we will continue, as we do, to tackle digital exclusion. The 75,000 that I spoke about uh, will already be providing, uh, have provided uh, families who didn't have connections with those connections uh, in order that as we roll out uh, and complete the, the commitments around uh, the delivery of uh, next generation broadband, of course a reserved uh, responsibility that the Scottish Government is having to step in and largely fund because the UK Government is failing in its commitments there, then we will also make sure that people have the wherewithal uh, to use that. So whether it's baby boxes, whether it's the doubling of early education uh, and childcare, whether it's the child payment doubled to you know, lift children out of poverty, but also mitigate uh, the brutal attacks on incomes of uh, a Westminster I... Tory government, or whether it's whether Excuse it's no, Mr. whether Kerr, it's laptops you a bit of latitude. or tablets, whether it's all of that, we will continue to make sure Scotland is the best place in the world for children yeah. to grow up, despite the best efforts of those elsewhere in the UK that try to drag us backwards. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I'll bring you back in if we have time at the end, and I call uh, Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Very much, uh, the presiding officer, <clears throat> and um, I'd like to ask this final question around uh, another key issue that the. Obviously, we. Audio is. Audrey, your audio isn't working. Can, can I ask you to start that question again, please? Thanks, presiding officer. Apologies. I'd just like to ask a, a final question around um, another key issue that the Criminal Justice Committee has been looking at, and that's the prison estate. Now, we all know that COVID has put a massive strain uh, on staff and prisoners in prisons, and I'm sure the First Minister would join me in commending how well the service has responded. And one means by which we can ease the situation is having enough resources in place and investing in what is often uh, considered to be an antiquated estate, estate uh, dating from the Victorian era. And in our budget report, the Criminal Justice Committee called for uh, a sustained above inflation uh, injection of funds into the prison budget. And we welcome the 4.2 per cent increase in operating costs, but no increase uh, has been made in the capital budget for infrastructure uh, improvements. So I'd just like to ask the First Minister what scope is there uh, for even a modest increase in capital costs, for example, uh, to fund small-scale schemes, um, drug recovery cafes, to, and also to provide uh, items of technology to allow prisoners to stay in touch with their families, which we know can make a really big difference to regimes in prison uh, and are very much seen as a preventative spend. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. So, in terms of what scope there is for, for more, I, I don't want to unduly raise expectations. We have you know, put forward Parliament has approved the budget for the next financial year. I think it was in response to Claire Baker. I did talk about in-year adjustments and priorities we might set for that. So we will you know, keep in mind all of these you know, very legitimate calls for, for funding. But this is a, a tight budget, both in resource terms and in capital terms. Uh, we've invested uh, significantly in the prison estate in past years. There are further investment plans. The existing capital budget will be supporting investment in the infrastructure of the estate. I, I absolutely agree with uh, Audrey Nicholl about uh, some of the examples uh, cited there that will can help keep people out of prison, which is really important. Some of them uh, sound as if they may be uh, partly at least uh, revenue uh, fundable as opposed to capital. Uh, but there are strong plans in the overall justice budget to support community services, to support rehabilitation and to focus as much as we can on keeping people who are, are better facing a punishment as well as being helped to be rehabilitated out of prison, out of uh, prison, so that the that our justice system is overall uh, as effective as it can be. But we will continue to support the prison uh, service and the very difficult work it does all of the time, but particularly during COVID, uh, as much as we can in a financial sense. 
Thank you. And I call on Dean Lockhart to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Dean. Uh, thanks very much. First Minister, I would like to come back to net zero because, as you probably know, the UK Climate Change Committee has expressed concerns that the credibility of the Scottish climate framework is in jeopardy. That is a direct quote. An example given was the publicly owned energy company announced in 2017, but uh, it never actually saw the light of day. Instead of a publicly owned energy company, the Scottish Government has announced plans for a public energy agency to deliver on the decarbonisation of heat in Scotland. But this will be a virtual agency uh, with no additional staff, no additional budget and no additional resource and will only be operational by 2025. Given the sheer scale of the challenge in this area, which you acknowledged in a previous question, how can this virtual agency with no additional budget or resource be a credible answer? First Minister. Um, if I can say um, candidly, I think we face, like all countries do, many, many challenges in meeting our very ambitious and our climate change ambitions are uh, more stretching than most other countries in the world. So we, we face many challenges. I'm not saying for a second uh, what you've just described there is not one of them. I'm not sure I would describe it as the, the biggest one in terms of, of what we face. And we pay very close attention to the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, uh, published its uh, most recent report around the climate compatibility checkpoint for new oil and gas exploration just last week. They have got lots of very important things to say that help uh, us scrutinise our plans and no doubt help Parliament scrutinise them as well. Uh, we did change our plans in terms of a publicly owned energy company. That, of course, was meant to be a retail-based uh, company, not an asset-owning uh, company. But the changing uh, situation around energy, uh, the pandemic, uh, led us to change our plans uh, in favour of what we are now pursuing, which is the agency that you uh, describe. And as we develop that, obviously there has been consultation on that. Uh, we will be very clear about the contribution we think that can make uh, to our overall uh, plans to achieve our climate change targets. I, I think it will be important. Um, but as I say, I think there are many other, uh, in fact, you, the subject matter of your last question, I think is a much bigger challenge in terms of how we meet our climate change targets. Yeah, just to follow up, but, but this agency is tasked to deliver on the decarbonisation of heat in Scotland with no additional resource, no additional staff. It's a virtual agency and it won't become operational until 2025. Do, isn't that in, uh, an example of a policy that lacks credibility? It, it does. Um, obviously, all of our policies we need to uh, subject to, to scrutiny and challenge so that we can get them right. But this is about uh, introducing an agency that can, as we go through further through this decade, better coordinate um, and lead the efforts we're making there. It is not the case that our work around this, and we talked about this earlier on, uh, waits until 2025, until this agency is operational, it will become an important part of how we guide and coordinate this work. But that work is, as I say, we reflected on earlier, is already well underway. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Uh, I'll call Jackson Carlow to be followed by Eleanor Whitson. Uh, First Minister, could I return to where we began, which is the outrage in Ukraine? Um, many community groups, I think, are finding the public response in Scotland immediate, overwhelming, I think stunning, in fact. But it's clear, I think, this morning that there is a logistical challenge emerging. Uh, such has been the response that I think it has outstripped the initial provision of the logistical transport that will be needed to actually deliver community group support to the Ukraine uh, or to Poland or to wherever people uh, may currently be and are going to require it. Uh, and I wonder if there's, you made reference to the hub you visited this morning. I wonder if there's something more the Scottish Government could do to give um, public information and in, in a forceful way which will uh, facilitate really that huge response by the Scottish public not finding itself stuck where it can't actually serve any purpose. I mean, the response has been outstanding and, you know, understandably people right across the country want to do whatever it is they can to help and support. Um, and yes, I think there is more we can do to try to uh, not get in the way of that or, or supplant that in any way, but coordinate and facilitate it. Uh, Cabinet uh, yesterday actually had a discussion about this uh, featured in a, a resilience committee that I chaired uh, yesterday. So we are going to... Uh, as quickly as we can, look to see what advice that we could usefully, um, in fact, Elena Whittam raised this with me in another forum just yesterday, uh, what advice we can usefully give, usefully give to people about how they can best contribute, uh, where uh, physical goods are being contributed, uh, donated or, or gathered, uh, how logistically we can support uh, them getting to where they need to be. Obviously, uh, aid 
agencies and charities have a big part to play in this. So we're doing some work right now to, to try to put some, uh, s some structure around this. Um, I've asked my officials to prepare in, in as quick a timescale as possible. Um, a letter to go to all MSPs in the first instance, setting out some of this detail, which then can be used uh, to communicate with constituents. But we'll also uh, seek to uh, raise public awareness um, around it. So I, I don't, sitting here right now, have all of the answers to exactly what that will look like. But I do recognise that it's important that we help ensure that the groundswell outpouring of support actually finds its way to people in Ukraine who need it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Eleanor Whittam, um, and then I'll follow that up with Claire Adamson. Eleanor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank my colleague Jackson Carlow for bringing that really important issue um, up today, because it is really important that we do respond to that absolutely stunning um, display of, of solidarity that we're seeing from our communities. But my question relates to Social Security. So I've seen from my time on the Social Justice and Social Security Committee how low-income benefits delivered by the Scottish Government by their very nature must rely on the underlying entitlement of reserve benefits and therefore require close collaboration with the United Kingdom's government. Do you believe that this collaboration is working to deliver for the people of Scotland and what more could be done to make this efficient and um, effective? Thank you. So a practical of official uh, level, yes, I think the engagement between the Scottish Government and the DWP as we have designed and introduced uh, these new benefits or in some cases transferred responsibility for the benefits, that has, has worked well and you know, officials uh, in the DWP uh, work with us to try to ensure that whether it's transfer of information or uh, you know, the detail we need to design our systems here that that is, is operating uh, effectively. Obviously, there are political disagreements, and uh, you know these are inescapable sometimes. But they haven't, by and large, got in the way of that very important and effective uh, work to allow us to achieve what has been done so far. How can that be done better? I, I'll go back to what I said earlier on. I, I think it would make more sense on a practical basis if we had more of these social security powers joined up under the aegis of the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament. So, you know, sometimes the, one of the limiting factors in a benefit we are trying uh, to deliver is, as you say, the underlying entitlement set by UK benefits. So it's difficult for us to change that. So what we can achieve is limited from the outset. So I think if we have a more a holistic arrangement, we will be able to deliver more. And hopefully in the future, that's what we'll have. Thank you, Ella. I now call Claire Adamson, who will be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Unless anybody else catches my eye, uh, Kenneth will be the final questioner in this session. Claire. Thank you very much, De Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, I had a constituency visit to Neighbourhood Networks uh, on Monday and met with some of the representatives from Dot, Spells Hill, Motherwell and Wisha, who were telling me about their activities, which included drumming lessons, guitar lessons, dancing. Um, we were reading poetry that had been developed and hearing about creative writing classes. And to me, it epitomises what the committee has been looking at in terms of what wellbeing means in a community setting and how culture has such an important part to play in that. So we did cover this in our budget scrutiny. And I wonder if you could just tell us how your government will ensure wellbeing is delivered throughout all portfolio areas of the government. First Minister. We, we seek to do that as a matter of course, because I, you know, and we won't always succeed. Uh, let me be candid about that in, in the first instance, and there'll be many areas where we need to do better to ensure that that is embedded. But any, any aspect of government policy that is not contributing to the well-being of people across the country um, is not doing what it, it should be doing, because fundamentally that's the most important thing. And there are many different aspects of that and many different ways in which we measure overall well-being or which we consider overall well-being. But that's what governments are there to do, to improve the well-being of the people they serve. Uh, culture's got such a massive uh, role to, to play in that. And, you know, you've cited a, a constituency uh, example there just in the last couple of weeks. I've, you know, seen first-hand examples of this, you know, at Scottish Opera in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago, uh, listening to a project, details about a project that, that they lead, working with people with long COVID uh, and people with dementia, using the power of song uh, to help in both with breathing uh, difficulties of people with long COVID and also the mental health uh, difficulties of people uh, with long COVID or 
people who've struggled in, in other ways during the pandemic. So there's a very real example. Uh, I was at the Paisley Book Festival on Saturday uh, talking about poetry with uh, Catherine Jamie, the, the macker, and you know somebody from the audience there talked about a poetry project that was doing exactly the same. So, you know, culture is such a, a strong and important sector of our economy. It contributes massively uh, financially to Scotland, but it's much, much, much more than that. It is about our well-being, it's about our happiness, it's about how we engage with each other, it's about how we understand and empathise with each other, it's how we learn about different parts of Scotland and different parts of the world. And it is so vitally important that we see it in that deeper and more fundamental sense. Thank you. I now call on Kenneth Gibson, who will be followed by Finlay Carson, who took us into the general questions, so it's probably fitting that he takes us out of the general questions at the end. Kenneth. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, First Minister, Secretary of State Michael Gove advised our committee last Thursday that UK ministers will involve themselves in devolved areas ranging from local government to ferry provision in the Western Isles to uh, literacy and numeracy, numeracy programmes, all without consulting with Scottish uh, ministers in any of these decisions. So how concerned are you about the rolling back of devolution? Very. I think that's the express objective of the current UK government, is to undermine, roll back, uh, get in the way of this parliament doing its job. And, you know, people don't have to agree with us politically, I think, to see what is obvious to anybody who's paying any attention to Scottish politics. And it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable democratically. Um, this parliament is... Uh, was constituted with uh, certain powers, those powers have grown over the years, and this government and parliament are elected democratically by the people of Scotland to exercise those powers and to hold the government uh, responsible uh, for them. And therefore, I think it should matter to all of us uh, that that is not uh, attacked in the way it's been attacked with the, the kind of power grabs that we're, we're speaking about. Um, whether the UK government will have any success in doing any of this, of course, is a, another matter. And, you know, some may look at their performance in their own areas of responsibility and think that they probably won't uh, be successful, but that's uh, another matter. The very fact that they're trying, um, I think, shows the utter contempt with which they uh, view the Scottish Parliament and Scottish democracy. And for those of a different political persuasion to me in this Parliament who might roll their eyes at that, you only have to listen to Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales, or uh, politicians in the Northern Ireland executive to know that these concerns are not uh, exclusive to the SNP Scottish Government, uh, they are shared by devolved administrations elsewhere. Okay. And Finley Carson. Thank you. Um, rural depopulation is, is of significant concern to, to our committee, but post-COVID <clears throat> there is a, an opportunity for more people to work from home, but that, that's put at risk by the lack of broadband. Now, we know that regulation of telecommunications is reserved to Westminster. However, I'm sure you wouldn't wish to mislead the public in suggesting that the physical rollout and the rollout of R100 is absolutely the responsibility of the Scottish Government. Um, the, the, cabinet secretary, the former Cabinet Secretary said he would resign if all of Scotland didn't have superfast broadband by the end of 2021. But we now know that it's going to be 2025 before people in the Highlands and the south of Scotland will get broadband. Where did it go wrong? We're rolling out broadband faster than I think any other part of the UK. We are certainly taking responsibility for it because uh, UK governments have uh, not uh, stepped up and uh, fulfilled their responsibility. And if you look at the, the funding, uh, the absolute lion's share, about 90% of the funding for it is coming from the Scottish Government. Uh, we will be also providing vouchers uh, along the way, either for uh, areas that can't uh, physically access it or where they are later in the programme. But we are... Uh, fixed on uh, doing that because it is so important and you, the premise of your question is right. Uh, we need to make sure that access to broadband, and this is the, the journey we are on, is as uh, easy and as fundamental as access to electricity is, and that then, I think, helps continue to transform the ability of people to live in, work in um, and build lives in the rural parts of the country. But that said, Derek Mackay committed £600 million pounds five years ago to, with a commitment and a promise to deliver by the end of 2021, that's not going to happen. So that is a failure. But I'm asking you, where did it go wrong? I don't think it has gone 
nothing wrong. We have, uh, you know, we, we, we deal with some of the most challenging topography um, anywhere in Europe. Uh, we have made massive strides in the delivery of broadband. We are continuing to make sure that money, the £600 million, uh, you're right to say, came from the Scottish Government. And despite the reserved uh, aspects of the responsibility here, I think at one point it was £20 million contributed or something by the UK Government. So if you want to trade, you know, sort of responsibilities here, I'm happy to sit here for a long time um, and do that. So that programme is underway. I think we are uh, one of the fastest parts, if not the fastest part, in terms of the progress right now around uh, broadband, and we'll continue to focus on completing that and providing the voucher support for people uh, who need it along the way. I'm going to squeeze in one final question, because colleagues have been so helpful in, uh, in being concise with their questions, the First Minister concise with their answers. So, Dean Lockhart, on the basis that it is equally concise, you have the last word. Thank you very much. Yes, very briefly, the committee I convene is the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Mr Gibson mentioned ferries. Uh, a further delay, uh, First Minister, has been announced in the delivery of the two ferries being built at Fergus and Marine. Um, are you personally involved in trying to fix this ongoing shambles? I, of course, as I am with everything the Scottish Government is responsible for, involved uh, in making sure that uh, the right things have been done by my Cabinet Secretaries, Ministers and officials. Uh, having oversight of that, that is my responsibility. Um, but uh, Kate Forbes is the lead minister on this and I know has been keeping Parliament uh, up to date and will continue to do that. The latest issue around cabling and the ferries, which uh, was something that... Uh, happened, uh, has only just come to light, but happened before the Scottish Government, of course, took ownership uh, of Ferguson Shipyard is something that uh, the management there now is very uh, focused on fixing as quickly and as cost effectively as possible. Okay. But very do, briefly. Yes, do, do you acknowledge that this has been one of the, the worst procurement exercises in devolution? Uh, I'm not going to allow you to put words in my mouth. Uh, there have been a number of very, very difficult challenges along the way, which we are still working through, and I would not have uh, wanted it to transpire like this. I think you can take that uh, as read, uh, but we are very focused on getting it on track, getting it fixed, and making sure Ferguson's, which is important, because we have ensured that Ferguson's uh, continues supporting the employment uh, that is supported by that shipyard uh, and making sure that it has a sustainable future. OK, I think before this descends, um, can I uh, thank all uh, colleagues for their questions, the First Minister for giving up our time to um, uh, respond to those questions. Briefly, before we conclude, uh, First Minister, could I just raise an issue that has been raised um, uh, in earlier meetings of the conveners group? Be aware there have been some concerns around uh, some of the LCMs. Uh, there have been a number of occasions where the timescales involved have left committees with little time to carry out their scrutiny of an LCM. This was raised, uh, as I say, at previous meetings of the conveners group. Um, we appreciate that committees have significant work programmes uh, with very busy agendas, and so they need adequate time to consider the LCMs. Uh, we recognise that these need to, um, time to allow for discussions uh, and negotiations with the UK Government. It would be helpful if LCMs uh, could be lodged at the same time as these discussions are taking place. Uh, they can always be updated at a later date. However, this would uh, allow the process to begin and committees to get moving with their, uh, their scrutiny. Um, I'm not necessarily expecting a response now, but if, if you were able to come back to the conveners group uh, on that point, would be very good. Do that. I will ask the Minister for Parliamentary Business to look specifically at whether there is a different process that we can put in place, at least in principle, um, to try to resolve the issue you're raising. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, just to confirm, the next meeting uh, is on Wednesday the 30th of March. We will consider issues relating to strategic priorities, in particular pro progress on scrutiny of post-EU devolution issues. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, colleagues for your attendance and I close this meeting. Thank you.